Welcome to The Daily, I'm Neil Patterson. And following on from a previous episode, wildfires continue to burn around the Mediterranean, including what is a 10th day of blazes on the Greek island of Rhodes. The flames are growing. Then, in the nick of time, reinforcements arrive. For now, Alex's home is safe. The data linking the rise in global temperature to human activity, well, it's never been stronger. And the link between the rising mercury and extreme weather events is itself being strengthened every year. The Copernicus Climate Change Service saying today that globally we're on track for July to be the hottest month on record. And we've also been hearing from Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General. Humanity is in the hot seat. And yet it feels, feels as if climate scepticism is also hotting up, particularly regarding the pursuit of net zero and other environmental policies. I mean, just take a look at the results in the Uxbridge by-election. The Labour Party, they'd been supremely confident of taking the seats, only to lose by a few hundred votes, because of the Labour Mayor of London's expansion of the ultra-low emissions zone. Politicians, both red and blue, are now blowing hot and cold over their green policy portfolios. Social media is ablaze with claims that the wildfires were started deliberately and therefore nothing to be worried about, let alone linked to climate change. All the while, the environmental lobby screams that we are headed for apocalypse. An absolute bundle to discuss then. At later, we'll be looking at the root causes of the scepticism and examine whether it's the science that people are doubting or perhaps the path to net zero itself. But let's begin with Sky's climate reporter, Victoria Siebert. Victoria, great to have you on, on The Daily. Before we get into the science, I just want to talk about the way that we, as an organisation, approach this story. I mean, you are one of two reporters that we have working on this brief. We have a weekly podcast focusing on climate issues. We used to have a daily, now have a weekly climate-focused show. Are we in danger as an organisation, Sky News, of being accused of of arriving at conclusions that the science has not yet gotten us to? No. <laughs> OK, I think you would say that. <laughs> we report on the science that has been peer-reviewed using well-established methods and so on and so on. There are occasional exceptions to that where the story is so significant that it merits being reported even when it hasn't quite gone through such a rigorous process, but we will also specify that in the piece. But the science of human activity causing climate change is settled. The science of that climate change fueling heat waves in particular, there is a widespread consensus for that across thousands of scientists all around the world. Let, let's try then, as we get into this podcast, to, to kind of set the stage for, for, for further discussion and establish that scientific consensus. I mean, the, the latest piece we've researched, we mentioned it in the introduction there, the Copernicus Climate Change Service, EU funded, as, as I have to say, otherwise someone will suggest in my comments later that there is a problem with it being EU funded. But, but they are suggesting that the first three weeks of July, the warmest three week period on record, and the month is on track to be the absolute hottest ever. They have come out with this a little bit early before the month is out, and I suppose that could open them up to a little bit of criticism. But I spoke to one of the scientists involved, and he explained that because it has been so hot already in July, that's why they can say with such confidence that they're virtually certain. So they do say these figures are provisional. The previous record was in either July 2019 or 2022, give or take, because there's some margin of error. Those months were around 16.6 degrees on average. That's a global average temperature. July looks like it will be around 16.9. Those 0.3 degrees, that doesn't sound like a lot. But actually, when you're looking at the whole world, that's a really significant gap. So even if temperatures were to suddenly plummet, which they're not expected to over the next few days, they're still pretty confident that it will still be above that 16.6. But doesn't global temperature move in cycles, that there are periods of cold and that there are periods of relative warmth as well? The weather varies, as we know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I didn't bring too, my raincoat today. All too well here, exactly. Last summer was really hot. At the moment, it's a little bit cooler than average in the UK. So if you're looking out your window, it can be quite hard to sort of reconcile these things that you're hearing if it doesn't chime with what you're seeing day to day. But the key thing is often people are comparing maybe hour to hour, day to day. The climate moves over much longer time scales, so months, seasons, years, decades, and it's that overall trend that is giving this indicator. Where next should we be looking for, for evidence that this is a real phenomenon 
and indeed that it is having the, the effect that the climate scientists are telling us, which is we've always had extreme weather events, but we're seeing them increase in frequency and we're seeing them increase in potency. Just this morning, our own Met office had a pretty stark warning for the UK. So remember last summer how hot it was? The 40 degree heat really <laughs> stands I out. I drove into work at three o'clock in the morning and it was 33 degrees Celsius at that point. It was incredible. It's incredible. Uh, unbelievable. Every month last year, apart from December, was a, above average for temperature. All four seasons were in the top 10 warmest. And the Met Office said, remember that. That seemed extraordinary at the time. But actually, because the climate is changing by 2060, that will be an average year. And by the end of this century, when, you know, still in the lifetime of many young children now, that will be regarded as a, as a cool year. People will be listening to that, particularly people who live in, you know, perhaps colder parts of the United Kingdom and say, look, OK, I can accept that. So why am I being told on an almost daily basis that we are standing on the cliff edge, that apocalypse and catastrophe await us uh, unless we head towards net zero immediately? It's a big challenge, particularly in the UK. We've had quite a few reports this year criticising the government for not adapting the UK that well to cope with climate change and particularly with heat. I mean, last year... A runway at Luton was closed when it was hot. Railways didn't cope very well. There were around 2,800 excess deaths of vulnerable people during the, during the hot period. So, yeah, we, we do need to adapt, but uh, we're not doing that quick enough, and it is quite hard. We've also been hearing from the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, as well. Just tell us a little bit about what the UN's role is in all of this and, indeed, what they've been saying. The UN oversees a lot of these bodies, so the data that we've had today on July came out from Copernicus as well, well as the World Meteorological Organization. The Secretary General Guterres has become increasingly forceful and vocal in his warnings, things like highway to hell and what else we've heard today. The consequences are clear and they are tragic. Children swept away by monsoon rains, families running from the flames, workers collapsing in scorching heat. For vast parts of North America, Asia, Africa and Europe, it's a cruel summer. For the entire planet, it is a disaster. It is a difficult balance to strike because we've got this one and a half degree warming limit that we've agreed we need to try to stick to, but sometimes that can give the impression that it is a cliff edge afterwards. But actually, the reality of it is that every sort of tenth of a, of a degree matters. So one and a half degrees is desirable, but 1.6 is better than 1.7. And that's what we need to try to communicate and strike that balance between these are the, the serious risks that this kind of change poses. And we're seeing that, for example, with the heat waves. But on the other hand, there are things we can do. It's not too late. How bad it gets depends on, you know, what we do now. Do you think that the general public have a good working understanding of what net zero actually means. Net zero that we hear quite a lot about, net zero policies, net zero targets and so on, that means that we should try to reduce our emissions, emissions of what causing climate change, reduce those as much as we can, and then everything else we need to try to offset somehow. But obviously that is all quite vague because reduce emissions as much as possible you know, who, who decides that? And that can potentially allow, allow people to sort of uh, hide behind that a little bit and say, well, I've done as much as I can and I'll, I'll use carbon offsetting, so something like um, tree planting or maybe some technology to suck the equivalent emissions mm. out of the air. But the problem with those is either they're very expensive, some of them can be quite hard to guarantee long term, but ultimately there isn't enough tech or trees in the world to offset all the emissions. Do you think that if I asked an average member of the public, name me policies that we could use to get to the net zero goal, do you think that they've been informed enough about them? I think it really varies by region. Yeah. And I think we'll really see that in the run up to the general election next year. We'll see how much climate and the environment is part of the national debate. Obviously, there's a um, little bit of stepping back from that at the moment. Mm. But these issues are really important to people locally, as we saw with ULES in Uxbridge, as we might see further debate over the coal mine that's potentially coming in Cumbria. So these, uh, on a local level, these issues do tend to be very important to people. Victoria, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks for coming into the day. Thank you.
clearly, there is a country mile between climate denialism, simply not accepting that humans are warming the planet, and, and those who question the need for immediate drastic action, or indeed question the action that governments are already taking, often at a cost to the individual. Let's speak to Leo Hickman, director and editor of Carbon Brief, a website that covers uh, climate science and policy, also formerly chief advisor on climate change uh, to the World Wildlife Fund UK. Um, Leo, you're absolutely perfect guest for us to speak to at this point. Um, in your mind, I mean, how, how prevalent is climate scepticism right now and, and how damaging potentially is it? Whenever we have these periods of extreme weather events, it seems to be a moment where the climate scepticism almost doubles down. It almost it amplifies and it increases. And I think there's there's a few reasons behind that. But I think broadly, when you look at polling around this kind of issue and people are asked, are you a climate skeptic? And I.e., and that needs a little unpacking. Like, does that mean you you actually don't accept the underlying science of climate change or does that mean you're a policy skeptic and i think over the last decade there's been a bit of a shift on that but anyway if we just take it at the raw meaning like someone who actually denies and doesn't accept the underlying science of climate change that it's caused by humans then that is very low level in terms of the the polling it's in you know, it's very it's arguably low single figures in percentage terms but if you broaden it out to be are you a skeptic of the policy response to climate change then that then that moves around. It kind of comes. It can come up to around you know twenty percent of the population. Sometimes this has been a very very fascinating moment in this kind of long journey, really, and it will be a continuing journey of how the public and how humanity at large grapples, internalizes, and then acts on something such as climate change. If that that that, that kind of out and out climate denialism is, as you say, in, in low single figures, why does it feel like it's much much larger than that? Particularly every time I dip my my toe into social media. I mean, we did a podcast very recently on on the heat that was taking you know, the heat wave and the, the the fires and roads. Half the comments broadly positive, half the comments suggesting, well, this was obviously arson and it has nothing to do with climate change. I think additionally to that, we have a, a government in the UK at the moment which is sort of beholden to a kind of hardcore group within the Conservative Party. It probably totals no more than about 20 to 30 people within the within the political party in, in Parliament, including the Lords and the MPs, who are part of something called the Net Zero Scrutiny Group. They are effectively policy sceptics around Net Zero. And for whatever reason, internally within the Conservative Party, and then hence the government, they have seem to have a disproportionate influence. The other thing we can't really ignore is the media in the UK. We've got a very misweighted and disproportionate media landscape, particularly within the UK national newspapers. You've got The Sun, The Express, The Mail, the Telegraph and all of their Sunday equivalents pretty much actively or indirectly campaigning against net zero and climate change more widely. And that filters down because it filters into the politics. It's this kind of feedback loop, something we see in the climate, ironically, but it's actually a political feedback loop. When we look at the broadcasters who would, I think some of them would describe themselves as right of centre in, in their tone and certainly in their, their presenter rota, what I often see happening there is a single issue being taken, a single point being taken and used as a wedge to drive into, you know, the, 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 the kind of the consensus around climate change. Take, for example, those wildfires that in roads, it has been reported and we've reported it here on Sky that those were originally started by arson and therefore have nothing to do with climate change. Now, of course, you and I both know that even if they were started deliberately, that doesn't mean that the effects of them have not been exacerbated by these record high temperatures. This happens every single time there's wildfires. You've seen it for the last five to 10 years. It's almost Groundhog Day to some extent in the way that the climate skeptics and their sort of, and the, the politics around that always come out. It's the underlying conditions of that scrubland, that forestry that has been parched through drought, extended drought conditions, which means whatever the ignition mechanism is, 
it's just going to go up. And then you've got the incredible winds that we saw in what we've been seeing in Rhodes and across Greece and across the Mediterranean, which have been obviously whipping up and exacerbating the impact of these wildfires. It's a standard claim you hear every time to sort of undermine and diminish the impact of these wildfires, which is frankly kind of insulting to the victims of these wildfires. And ultimately just doesn't help us as, as a species, if you like, deal with this issue of climate change. It's absolutely the classic head in the sand territory. One of the claims that is always made by those who seek to deny man-made climate change is that people are being manipulated, that the data is being manipulated. And most recently, this has happened with, with temperatures around the med, the difference between temperatures on the ground and temperatures in the air. It's classic playbook um, is to go after the science, try and present that your you have equal scientific understanding amongst the climate scientists. We saw this with COVID as well. It's really not unique to climate. You go back 40 years and you see how the tobacco industry tried to undermine the campaign to phase out tobacco and smoking. They nitpick it. They, they kind of went after the science, tried to undermine the data, the methodology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And sure, they pushed back the ultimate banning of smoking in public places by a few decades, probably. You're seeing exactly the same playbook playing out with, with climate sceptics now. Fundamentally, the science is incredibly robust. If you look at a variety of metrics, whether it's the, the ocean temperatures, the amount of um, ice around Antarctica and the Arctic, um, the amount of warming globally, regionally, just everywhere you look on the dashboard of climate, it all all the lights are flashing red at the moment. Um, and it is an extraordinary summer, to be honest. And we've, you know, we we're we're basically July. This July is the hottest month ever recorded, which is pretty sobering stuff. The Paris Agreement in 2015 tried to saw all the worlds agree that we should try to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And we go on current trajectory, we're going to bust well past that. And we're, and yet we're already seeing the impacts at just after one degree of warming. Thanks, Leo. And I suppose that if we accept that there is a need for action, then politicians need to take the public with them and perhaps even provide them more than one option, one route to take. Uh, joining us now, James Woodhausen, visiting professor of forecasting and innovation at London's South Bank University. James, let's start with the fundamentals. Do you believe that of late that there has been a shift in public attitudes towards green policy, the pursuit of net zero and so on. I think a more fundamental issue is, has the public really ever been consulted hmm. about green policy? There are plenty of pressure groups and non-governmental organisations, but I think the public e likes the environment, is uh, reasonably concerned about uh, climate change, but if you take the full panoply of net zero measures that we're now enduring and about to endure, the public hasn't been asked about that and is not convinced. But I do believe the public would welcome some kind of serious debate on this whole issue because it's hitting them in their pockets. And that's the thing that's becoming more and more clear. Whichever sector you look at, people are hitting the dawning realisation, if they didn't know before, and many did know before, that, you know, when the rubber hits the road, it's all going to be very costly, very tricky, and the government and the opposition haven't really done their sums right. I remember the last referendum we had in this country, and it didn't especially go brilliantly. Everyone's riven down the middle again. Let's avoid that. But But from what you are saying... People have not been placed, put in a position of being able to make an informed decision about the policies that we would need to follow to, to get to net zero. So isn't that just a failure of the politicians then? They think that we're such a bunch of energy wastrels that we want to go drilling and polluting everywhere we go that the only thing that will put us in our place is the net zero legislation, which was passed with virtually no opponents. Don't they just assume that there is a pressing need for us to get, get on with this and get it done? Well, they do, but, you know, they're living in a world of think tanks uh, and not of petrol tanks, right? They're not really bothering with the price of petrol uh, at uh, petrol stations. They're in chauffeur-driven limousines, Neil. Uh, they fly on private jets. So why should they have 
any kind of contact with popular concerns, except when an election starts hoving into view. And that's what's making some Tories a bit nervous. I think at the moment, the climate alarmists fasten on every fire in a Greek island and elsewhere to get us to ration our energy use, to accept austerity in relation to our living standards, to walk and cycle everywhere we go. That's the direction of policy. That's what net zero means in practice. And it means a constant hectoring of the public to tell us that we're bad guys. I don't accept that. And I don't think the British people uh, accept that. They want serious measures, but they want them to be properly out in the open. Is it the moralising? that we see from some environmental groups, certainly from some politicians, that you have an issue with? I've got a physics degree, mm -hmm. right? The science does not tell us which choice of technique to make to do something about climate change. Does the science tell us, Neil, that mining for cobalt in the Democratic Republic of Congo by Chinese mining companies is the way that we should uh, get the energy uh, source in our car um, namely batteries with cobalt in them. Does the science tell us to go mining in the Democratic Republic of Congo? No, 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 it certainly doesn't. And at, at a topic that is indeed, and it is indeed a topic that we've explored on this podcast with our, our, our economics and data editor, Ed Conway. You may want to have read his book, The Material World. But isn't that, again, the failure of the politicians to not articulate that if we are to head, to, if we are to get to net zero, we are going to have to take more stuff out of the ground than we ever have before? and in well, circumstances that's like the DRC. That's enormously true. But, you know, what it shows is that a whole raft of support for electric cars, which I'm not in principle against, but the whole raft that's been built, you know, without the charging stations, without the thinking about the 2030, 2035 cutoff points, without the thinking about the weight of the machines and the, all the, uh, you know, what they'll do to our parking um, um, blocks and all the rest of it, and our, what they do to our potholes, the thoughtlessness that attends the rush to electric cars is just shows how, you know, once you've got a conviction that you're saving the world and you don't have any other serious policies to uh, offer the, the public on economics, on uh, gender, uh, on democracy, on banks and so on, you just dis decide, I'm in charge of saving the world, then it doesn't matter that there's mining going on in cobalt. You're going to be keep, keeping quiet about that, and then eventually when the penny drops, you're going to be on the back foot. That's what's happening a bit at the moment. More and more people know about that stuff. More and more people know, Neil, that the adjective green means Chinese. That's what it means. Right? Expl explain I that don't point. Find well, because if you look at the composition of solar panels, the composition and the uh, the refining that goes alongside uh, goes along with electric batteries in electric cars, if you look at the key components in wind turbines, uh, and you, you also look at hydropower and other uh, green technologies, in every aspect of green energy technology, the Chinese are in the lead. They control the production process, they do a lot of the mining, they do the refining, they're in charge. Give us the counter case, give us the policy agenda that you would wish to see our politicians, first of all, asking the public about and informing them of and then moving forward with. First of all, we've got to recognise that in Britain as elsewhere, and Africa heroically is waking up to this, is that we're not going to get out of gas anytime soon. In fact, the more we rely on solar and wind, the more we'll need gas back up for those intermittent sources of energy. The second thing is we're like a slow coach on nuclear power. We want to rack it up from 16% to 25% of electricity generation by 2050. This is kind of a tortoise route to enfranchising nuclear. Thirdly, we are not pouring resources uh, in particular into small modular reactors. We've got a lengthy competition. Rolls-Royce may not win that. We're dawdling uh, on that as well. We're dawdling also on fusion power. So there's lots of measures that we can take that do not involve us mortgaging our future to uh, offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar power. Those are expensive technologies, much more expensive 
than people imagine. Let me give you another conundrum, if I may, Neil, which is, you know, I made the, the point about if North Sea oil is so dangerous to the planet, then why is it so uh, non-impactful for our economy? Uh, it can't be both. Well, uh, you know, if you take the price of green electricity, it's supposed to be nine times cheaper than gas, and, and we're using it more and more, green electricity. All right, if that's true, then how is it that our energy bills are going up? We're using more and more of the cheap stuff. Thanks, James. Uh, time just for a last word from you, Leo. There is no way to satisfy someone who is an out-and-out -out denier of, of, of something around which there is an overwhelming scientific consensus because there's always another point they want to make. A lot of the trolling online, I think, needs to just be ignored. But I think there's also a wider thing going on. I think we saw this play out quite acutely with the Uxbridge result last week, which was largely blamed that Labour just narrowly missed on winning that seat and the Tories held on. And it was blamed on the ULES car pollution scheme that's being rolled out or expanded in London. And actually, that was an air pollution issue. It wasn't really a climate issue, mm -hmm. per se, but it, it all just got conflated to try and make it this big thing about net zero. The political fallout of that moment over the last week or so really has honed in on actually quite an important issue, obviously, which is how do you communicate the urgency and need to act on climate whilst we have all these other competing economic and cost of living issues in the near term when climate change is often presented as a long term an issue away on the horizon yet as we're seeing this summer really is impacting the world right now now thanks to leo james and victoria that's your lot for this edition of the daily we'll see you next time